Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, product owners all around this great big world, including the one in Malta, welcome back to Deliver It. This is your Agile Product Owners Podcast. This is episode number 67. Today uh, is a day of sneezing. Um, I'm hoping I will not be too bad audio-wise, uh, but we'll see how things go. Spring is here in North Carolina, and uh, with that comes all the joy and uh, love that is pollen. So <laughs> hopefully it won't be too bad for you. Uh, I'm especially excited today because we have a guest. Uh, my guest today is the CEO and product owner at Scrum.org. He is a frequent speaker and author, including uh, the book that we're going to talk about today, the co-author of the new book, the Nexus Framework for Scaling Scrum, Continuous Delivering an Integrated Product with Multiple Scrum Teams. It's Dave West. Hello, Dave. Hello, Corinne. And I'm speaking to you from Boston. So our pollen is about three months away. I think. Ah, so, okay. uh, so I have no sneezing other than obviously it's cold and horrible up here at the moment. But uh... <laughs> It's fine. It'll be everywhere soon. <laughs> I hope so. Well, I kind of do and I kind of don't. It's one of those things, isn't it? You know? Yeah. You can't really stop it. It's fine. Um, so we'll talk about uh, the new book, the Nexus Framework book, which uh, I've uh, finished and I took the test and uh, I didn't take the test. There was an online assessment that I did. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the product owners and how it, uh, what changes for the product owner um, are about in the Nexus Framework. And I'm glad that Dave is here to talk with us about it. Uh, but first, a couple things that I read, uh, a couple things that I did this week. Uh, this is the last show that I wanted to share uh, Freakonomics, if you've read the books, listened to the podcast, is one of my favorite ones. I um, had a one uh, on about here's why all your projects are always late and what to do about it. Uh, they don't dig very deep into software products, although they do touch on that uh, with the guys who created Asana from Facebook and Google. But it's more about uh, bigger projects, uh, long-term infrastructure projects, and why they're always late and what you can do about it. Uh, several interesting concepts there that I think apply to product owners. And, and as we try to schedule things or look at planning things, um, the planning fallacy, uh, <laughs> there's an optimism bias uh, in that, that we always think it's going to go great this time. Uh, and we never take into that, uh, you know, the account that these things are going to go bad and we have project buffers and we always run into buffers and overruns. Uh, the example they gave in the show is there's a subway that they try to get built in New York that's been going on for, I think, 60 years. Uh, and the millions of dollars uh, that it's overdue, um, and really the coordination between the projects, which I think uh, ties nicely with uh, something we'll talk about today during the book, is you know you never really understand all the different pieces that have to go into a project, um, and so you forget about all those different pieces. Um, something that I've uh, recently, because uh, we did our PI planning recently, was our strategic misrepresentation. Basically, that you lie to get what you want um, by cooking, you know, uh, ROI calculations or uh, exaggerating how many customers will use something uh, when somebody comes back to you. So I, I think that was uh, very interesting. And then the sort of similar projects, look how long those similar projects took. Use something called reference class forecasting, which I think very sounds very similar to uh, no estimates and that type of thing, where it's just how many did you do last week or plan for that many. Uh, this week or, or last month. So I think there were some very interesting similarities there. And I really enjoyed the podcast. It's very well done. Um, and like I said, I think it's something that would be uh, interesting for product owners. Dave, you ever uh, partake in Freakonomics? I love Freakonomics. It's a, it's a great, uh, great series, great set of podcasts. Uh, it's interesting, that whole project thing. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. remember there was a book um, called The Mythical Man Month yes. by Fred Brooks yes. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Isn't it sort of ironic that we, this is the 2018 and we're still talking about that mm -hmm. some 40 something years later? Yeah. And you're like, oh, come on, you know? it's not rocket science but uh, it, everybody ends up uh, telling uh, yeah little pork is to represent their own to get their own mm -hmm. thing in and, mm -hmm. you know the lack of transparency the lack of honesty the lack of courage you know it's just the reality of you know the, the situations that we're in yeah so i think it's it's good there for for us i think it's good for everybody uh, the other thing that I read was uh, Martin Fowler uh, came out with uh, a new article about the revised Agile fluency model Diana Larson and James Shore have, which I think 
again, I've recommended this before the new model. Um, I still recommend, um, there's not, I, I couldn't see where the changes were specifically, but I really liked the model. I really like some of the more content they put into it after they've had it out for apparently about six years, uh, about focusing teams, delivering business value or, you know, and that's the, the very, uh, that's level one. Uh, and then level two is delivering teams, uh, delivering on that market cadence. Uh, three is optimizing teams, leading their market. And then the fourth level is strengthening teams, make it their organization stronger. Again, I think that the thing that's really useful there is these are the types of business benefits you can get from these different levels. And here's what you have to do to be able to recognize these biz business benefits, the investments that you have to make. And if you're not willing to make those investments, then this is what you're going to be able to get out of it. It's still agile. And it's still uh, valuable. It's just here's the value you can expect. You you want to get teams leading their market. If you don't invest in you know DevOps practices and uh, you know these types of really uh, impactful and hard, quite frankly, things for some organizations to get through, they can't get out of their own way. Uh, but they have to if they want to be able to get to these different levels. So I really like that model. Uh, I really encourage people to look at it again. Um, Dave, have you seen that model? Anything? Yeah, comments about I, that. Yeah, I love. Um, well, obviously, I love Martin Fowler, English Mafia, and all that. But Diane Larson and, and the work that uh, that that she's been doing on. I, I mean, it's a really good aid to memoir. The the uh, just to quote Ken Schwaber here: "Be careful to treat it like a methodology or a com or a CMMI for right. dummies. You know, do not think that this is your road to redemption. Right. It is a great." amazing set of good ideas mm -hmm. your situation is always slightly different your road to redemption or, or heaven or whatever whatever model you want to use in you know is it will always have some challenges that are, that are slightly different but it's a definitely a, a great ed uh aid to memoir a great sort of like checklist of thinking um it's 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 really really interesting work so i i also i i looked at it though i looked at the fowler thing and mm -hmm. i was like oh what's different i'm not i yeah. and then you know i need to do my github diff um just to see and i i couldn't really but it was you know it's great stuff yeah uh like i said it wasn't obvious but i still think it's worth another read another uh uh you know, update, uh, take a look and see, you know, where are you at with your organization? What does your organization want to get to? Uh, and then use that for some of the conversations that you'll have with your, with your stakeholders uh, and your teams, quite frankly. Uh, so I think it's really good. No doubt that this magnificent vessel will give excellent value for the dollars she'll be earning. Okay. So Dave is here because he's the co-author, one of three of the Nexus framework for scaling Scrum book, which I've, gotten through, been able to read and enjoyed it quite a lot. Thank you, Dave. Um, and we want to talk about how the Nexus framework applies to product owners. What do product owners need to know? Um, what's what's changed about um, uh, Scrum with the Nexus framework? And then what are some other things we wanted to do? So before we get into that specific, Dave, um, I was hoping you could kind of talk about, you know, what is the Nexus? Why do we need it? And what are some of the basics about it? So uh, it's interesting, you know, about three years ago, I guess it would be maybe a little bit further now. Time mm -hmm. does fly when you're having fun. Hey, yes. well, I was I wasn't actually working with Ken at that point. I was working the startup and talking to Ken a lot about scaling. Um, we just got some funding. So after the lavish party and uh, and million dollar website, no, mm -hmm. no, we really didn't spend a million dollars on the website. Don't quote me on that. Oh my God, the VCs will be like, what? Instantly there'll be a man knocking on my door. But after we'd sort of experienced some of that stuff, mm -hmm. we then started adding engineering teams, support, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, you know, was, we were heavy users of Scrum, but we had two Scrum teams and then we went to five, six, you know, it was like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to Cam about scaling and at the same time, he was being pressed by our community to have an opinion of, of around scaling. And mm. he said, well, hang on a minute. I've always, nobody could afford me just on a small project. What, I've always used Scrum on large projects. I mm -hmm. mean, what? I'm so confused. Um, and he said it in, in, a, in a very passionate way. But ultimately, I think it was very clear that we needed to provide guidance around how to use Scrum when you've got multiple teams working on the same, I'm going to say endeavor, ideally product, mm -hmm. um, when there's heavy dependencies and how do you raise transparency, et cetera. 
So we um, started, well, he started with the community looking at some of the consistent patterns that he saw uh, in, in those situations and working very strongly with the professional scrum community and, and the broader community on those, those things. And, and out of it came a guide, a very simple sort of like, hey, this is an exoskeleton to Scrum, it's still Scrum, mm -hmm. with some extra things that you would like to, you, you should think about very strongly if you're going to have multiple teams working on the same endeavor, which is always, always challenging. And he also sort of highlighted some very important things or Nexus highlights some important things like, don't scale until you can actually do something, you know? Mm -hmm. Don't suddenly, hey, we don't know what we're doing. Let's get more people, you know? It's, yeah. it seems to be the model of most large government programs that I've been involved in anyway. Mm -hmm. In doubt, we need more, mm -hmm. it really. And just some very simple things around that, you know, integrate frequently, mm -hmm. integrate as frequently as you possibly can, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, really it was born from that, born from the application. It wasn't invented you know, in in a sort of ivory tower and then uh, rolled out. Um, sure. Also, it doesn't do, so some of the other scaling frameworks, if we look at Scaled Agile Framework, DAD, and, mm -hmm. and Less and the like, all awesome, you know, with their own particular perspective on the world. It doesn't do everything. And one of the reasons why is because when we looked in details and we looked at Spotify and we looked at these organizations, we didn't find at that strategic planning level we didn't find consistency. Mm. Um, actually, interestingly, even if they're using something like safe, we found that though some of the words may be consistent, they actually weren't. How they were doing planning, the length, the complexity, you know, that sort of decomposition model wasn't actually that consistent. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little bit disappointing. So it doesn't it doesn't talk about that. It really just concentrates on, hey, you've broadly got an idea of the endeavor. Now what? You've got multiple teams working together. Now what? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's as simple as that. Some of the things that I took that were, I think the first couple chapters of the book are about the basic structure. And then you've got a, a case study that you're using as an example. It's not a real study, but it's a, it's a good example of, you know, some teams that go through, or maybe it is a real study that you've <laughs> changed the names to protect the innocent. I'm not sure. Well, it, it did actually interestingly start as a real study, and then we realized that it was just so awful that we wouldn't know. It was you know, they were like, and it takes so blimmin' long. You'd have to write a, a very long, very, and then nothing happened. And then, oh yeah. <laughs> a long time later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then a long time later. Um, but it was, it's definitely, the case study is definitely based on 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 reality. We ended up merging a couple in the end. Okay. Because because we found the case study model was actually made it more accessible. Otherwise, it can be a little abstract. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I think we tried to make it very usable and very pragmatic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the, the, the way the examples kind of built on each other. Um, and really for Nexus, what you're looking at is between three and nine teams, right? So you're not, lo you're not looking at just two teams, which are maybe you could do scrum with scrums if you needed to there, but above nine teams, it kind of, the dependencies and the integrations and things that you talk about, those kind of, those seem to want to fall apart in, in the model. Yeah. And that's really interesting. So uh, again, going back to uh, Fred Brooks, mythical man month, really mm -hmm. what, what we've seen. And, and by the way, this is not, Scrum's been around for 20 something years, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say I've seen every, and we as a community have seen every single type of project in every situation. And there's right. always exceptions that disprove any rule. But what we found was when, when teams were well over the hundred people, when there was multiple teams and it was well over a hundred people or 10 teams, that kind of number, mm -hmm. 11, 12 teams, they started to fall apart. And mm -hmm. there might be a un in the same way as a, a team can't be over that sort of universal number, you right. know, the nine, ten. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it does vary, but generally that sort of size and scope. What we found was that's that 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 sort of like works at large, you know. So when you've got multiple, you know, when you've got those each team represented an individual almost, and then bringing those together, it became unmanageable. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess it's the Amazon feeding people with pizza, you know, that sort of that kind of model. And, and it was really interesting because then I was thinking to myself, uh, and we've spoken about this a lot. And so what does this mean? Does this mean that there's a certain, you cannot 
change the laws of physics moment, you know, a sort of Scotty yeah. moment, Star Trek. Yeah. You know, uh, warp nine is as fast. Though they changed that afterwards and created trans warp because they got bored, didn't they? But <laughs> but the but is is there a certain point where it can't go any faster, can't get any bigger, can't get yeah. and and I would from what we've seen, that's true. I mean, look at SpaceX, right? Look yeah. at, you know, they're wide, they're amazing. Not only did they just put a rocket into space mm -hmm. and land bits of it, they landed them on barges just mm -hmm. to get extra hard. You mm -hmm. know, they got extra points for hitting them there. You know, how many engineers are on that? You know, software engineers, 30, 40? Yeah, n not much more than that. Mm -hmm. They kept their teams relatively small. You know, Amazon, great example of, now some would argue it's because they're cheap, um, but, you know, I would say part of it is, but it's ended up, they've kept their teams relatively small and they've done some amazing things. You know, you look at all these organizations and it, it becomes tricky. You know, even the Spotify model is kind of trying to keep things small and then providing support networks around them. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, the product owners out there um, don't fall to the, the sort of belief that if you want more things faster and bigger things, you have to have more people. Um, it, it, it is getting the right people, keeping them focused and, and giving them an environment that allows them to rapidly deliver. I think that's significantly more important than the more people, um, you know, maybe use other people to get lunch, maybe <laughs> other people to build tools that they can yeah. use, maybe build frameworks around them, but don't that, that those core teams keep them as small as possible. Yeah. And so the, the Nexus introduces, I guess, five or six new kind of ceremonies or coordination points, I guess, would be a better definition of these uh, things. Um, sprint planning, uh, the daily stand up. There's a new way to do that. Um, the re sprint review, um, which I'll touch on in a minute, because that's something that actually does change. Everything else pretty much stays the same. You just add another coordination uh, piece to this with um, kind of the new team that product owners are going to be involved with, which is that integration team at the Nexus level. Yeah, the the net was a bit of a so we found this over and over again. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even we used it at Task Top, the company I was working with, and um, and we were kind of like, is this really anti agile? It's one of these sort of moments where, hang on a minute, have we and you uh, created specialism? Right. You know, a specialism that's separate. Is this going to reduce our ability to be agile? One of the most important characteristics of Scrum is two: empiricism. You know, the ability to inspect for, you know, sort of build a hypothesis, deliver mm -hmm. something, get some feedback. That's one. And the second one is self-organization. Uh, empowered teams make decisions. You know, yeah. and, and the, what we see over and over again is when you kind of like reduce specialism. You know, I'm I do all the development. This is my swim lane and right. nothing else. You know, if you reduce that, you become more agile it's as simple as that you know the more flexible the team is the more dynamic the team is etc and next integration team we really did wrestle with and you know is this you know the specialism etc but we found a universal trend in all the companies uh, that we engaged with that were doing this was that there was some group of people that became, were servant leaders. Mm -hmm. Ideally, they were coaches. They mm -hmm. weren't they weren't doing the work, though they knew the work needed to be done. And they were meeting frequently to talk about integration, to talk about why it wasn't integrating, to deal with the issues that were so challenging when you've got multiple teams all trying to do trunk-based development or, you know, uh, yeah. continuous integration and continuous delivery. And what we found was this team, and it was really important also that the product owner was on that. And the reason why was because there was lots of decisions being made that normally were hidden from the business, inverted mm -hmm. commas, mm -hmm. that were incredibly important around integration, around uh, flexibility, around, you know, sort of like the, the, the sort of classic engineering tenants of um, uh, cohesion and coupling and, and the like. And sometimes it was good to get somebody in the room that wasn't as technical. That mm -hmm. isn't always the case with product owners, obviously, but that just to sort of say, hey, hang on a minute, let's talk about value. You know, what are we trying to do here and, and the like? So, yeah, so the knit has been a, I wouldn't say a thorn in a knit on our side or mm -hmm. whatever, but um, it definitely has been an interesting, but we found it over and over again. It was a pattern that was successful. And there's some other changes to like the uh, retrospective that you split that up into two parts because the integration team kind of does their retro first. And then that kind of feeds out that the, the sprint or the scrum teams, and then they come back and kind of see how things 
put got put together there. The planning, the stand up, you do a knit uh, stand up, and then that goes into the team stand ups, the knit planning, and then the team planning. So it does feel like that coordination. And the knit is not just uh, you know product owner, scrum masters for each of the teams. It's product mm-hmm. owner and mm-hmm. whoever from the other teams can talk about whatever challenge is going on today that needs to be discussed at a, uh, I, I want to say a program level, but at that larger um, scale level. Yeah, and that's actually very important. One thing that we found, uh, <laughs> many organizations doing Scrum of Scrum. Scrum, Scrum of Scrums was invented, I think, it may have been Jeff rather than Ken, but basically um, they were in a conference, so they may have both been on stage, and somebody said, hey, so when I've got multiple Scrum teams, what do I do? And Jeff, just said, hey, just cover Scrum of Scrums with them. And that kind of translates into the Scrum Masters all meeting, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. every, you know, and, and creating this, which really was kind of anti Scrum in a way, because it sort of meant that there was this group of people, this sort of group of very agile people that used to meet and Machiavellianly plan how agile was happening and all these different teams and sort of like, mm-hmm. oh, yes, he's not, you know. And no, that's not. No, so no, this isn't. This is very much, and you see this throughout, the right people are there. So, for instance, if one of the integration issues is integration with some sort of legacy system and there's a person that's an expert on that legacy system, they should come to the net. You know, uh, the NIT has its own Scrum Master to facilitate and to make sure that it flows and to raise transparency. That is the role of the Scrum Master. Um, um, But ultimately, the people that come to this should be the people that are the most um, heavily involved in integration at that moment. So that means that it's a fluid team. And then that's that's also very, very interesting that things can change and you can pull in people from outside as well. <gasps> that mm-hmm. sounds like an evil as well. But but ultimately, you may have somebody that's in um, operations, for instance, if you've separated these 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 disciplines and that person should come as well. You know, maybe it's an environmental issue, you know, the, the, the uh, transpa- transparency, inspect and adapt through transparency. That is the tenant of not just Scrum, but all agile approaches, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now, the NIT is all about trying to make things more transparent. They're trying to make it very visible. Sometimes the best way is to make it transparent to the people that are causing you harm. Uh, right. Not that operations is always, though my experience would indicate that it is. No, and the get those people involved. Get them involved in trying to do that. But don't let the NIT start building code. Mm-hmm. That's a, that is a sort of like a a bad pattern because suddenly then this you get this group of people that become very specialist and and then you get and you know them doing integration everybody delivering code to them or delivering stuff to them to allow them to do integration and mm-hmm. that, the rest doesn't doesn't really really work so anyway so gone back to the knit again but yeah um the other things you write there isn't I mean, we, we dropped or the the, uh, the so the sprint review mm-hmm. at the team level. That's kind of an important idea. Yeah. It, and, and the reason why we did that and what we've seen over and over again is it was very easy for separate teams to do their own thing, do a sprint review. Oh, I'm fine. Everything works, right? Yeah. But it isn't that isn't important. Even if they were doing, and I tried this many different ways um, in in my history. If even if they were doing trunk based. They'd only look at their bit. So there could be thousands of errors in every other person's mm-hmm. bit, but their bit worked. Mm-hmm. And then there's this apportioning blame. The idea of a nexus, uh, maybe badly named because of all the other, you know, the films with nexus in the title and phones from Google. But and it's not an acronym either. I mean, come on. <laughs> no, I know. Well, neither is Scrum, but that's another story. Anyway, so the. But the yeah, the reason why you have this nexus is you have this containment, this idea, but that th- they are responsible for delivering the product. It is as a group. So if one team completely destroys integration, yeah, yeah, you can throw blame, but it doesn't do any good. No. And it's it's funny. I don't know if you, just for fun, this is uh, something that I do, Corey. I, I listen to the earnings calls for Tesla, and and it's so much fun because Elon Musk, I mean, maybe I've got a bit of a boy crush. I don't know. But the, um, or should I say man crush? I don't know. I, you know I, guess we're, yeah. I guess we're all old now, aren't we? Damn. Isn't it? But anyway, anyway, but one thing that, that I hear him say, and he said it recently, so there was some analyst asking him questions around um, the model three and you know production up to f- what is it five thousand units and all that and he, mm-hmm. and he goes 
Well, he goes, yeah, well, yeah, there was a problem with the subassembly of, or the assembly, I guess, of batteries. And uh, and he said, and this guy was like, well, but there's a, an integrator. You paid an integrator. He goes, it's my fault. I picked the integrator. I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. I, last thing I want to do is litigate or whatever. I mean, ultimately, it's about us working together to solve the problem, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the embodiment of a nexus. It's the teams need to concentrate on the outcome, the sum of the part, you know, delivering the value at the end, right. not the, hey, my team's doing well, my team's are on. And that's the reason why we only have one product owner, because the last thing you want, and I know certain scaling frameworks do this slightly differently. Um, part of me just wishes they'd worked out what a product owner was, but we'll ignore that. And I'm not bashing anybody because it's a different approach. But what's interesting is, you know, if you have a central product owner, ultimately the product owner is responsible for ensuring that the most value is delivered, right? Mm -hmm. They're responsible for prioritizing and delivering its chief value officer for the product. Now, that means that a lot of work needs to be done, you know, analysis, yeah. design, all sorts of stuff. And that's, that's the team's responsibility to do that, you know, working with the product owner. But ultimately the decisions, there's only one person making those decisions, which mm -hmm. is very, very important. And I guess it's part of that whole integration mantra, as it were. Yeah, that was something, and I definitely want to talk about the the one the, the one product owner for nine teams aspect of this uh, in a minute. Uh, it is something, to get back to the sprint review, it is something that when I have multiple teams, teams that I'm working with, I do want to make sure that every team and every stakeholder is in the same sprint review call so that we can actually yeah. understand what the bigger picture is, right? Um, so I, I was very happy to see that. Uh, and it's something, like I said, that I've been doing because it, it does help people understand the bigger picture. It does un help people understand that your stuff impacts other people. Uh, and it is something where, hey, maybe they did something, maybe they used, we just had a case uh, this week where somebody used an API. Uh, one of the teams used an API a couple of months ago that one of the teams came up and said, hey, does anybody know if there's an API that does this thing that we're looking for? Yes, that team knows how to do it. Go talk to them, uh, talk to each other and, and coordinate that. So I, I really like that aspect of it. But it's hard because it is. there's all sorts of logistics issues. There's all sorts of physical. There's also this trust issue, mm -hmm. you know, that you really manifest itself. Imagine if you've got, a, you know, whatever, 90 people. You're trying to get 90 people on the same call watching the same thing. Yeah. You know, there's an embarrassment if you cock up. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you kind of, so the best idea is as a, as a product owner and as a, as, you know, the scrum masters that are facilitating this and the, the man, agile managers that are creating the environment for this, you have to be, make it a very comfortable environment. And that means, you know, you sort of put that, those guidelines, that team charter, that Nexus charter that says, look, we want to fail. And again, just to blow Elon Musk's um, trumpet as it were, or, or whatever. The um, what's interesting is that he, he when he was interviewed about the Falcon Heavy rocket and they interviewed him before it went off and he mm -hmm. goes they go oh you nervous he goes oh yeah it's fifty fifty could go either way but you know whatever yeah. happens we're going to learn something yeah. and they interviewed him afterwards and he said they go was that great he goes oh it was awesome you know I was very impressed da, 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 da. but he goes we'd have probably learned more if it had blown up <laughs> <laughs> like, yep. oh. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, getting that sort of mantra, of, it's, it isn't that we, you know, we don't want to fail fast. Obviously, we do not want to get fail fast, but we do want to learn fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to learn and get that information very visible, get that transparency. And so, um, yeah, Nexus Sprint Review can be a little daunting in regard to that, you know? So the product owner changes. So uh, product owners, it's still the one person accountable for the success. Um, still the person, I, I've used that word. Uh, there's a difference between accountability and responsibility, uh, but the product owners are accountable for it. Um, and then there is one product owner, even up to and including nine teams. Um, I've never been in that position where I've had, and I've had, you know, upwards in uh, five, eight teams sometimes. I've, I've always had multiple product owners that worked with me. Um, so I had a team of product owners. And I understand for Nexus, that's, there's one product owner. Um, that person is responsible. I imagine the teams that are doing this are pretty mature team, pretty experienced teams with, doing those same types of activities that a product owner would be needed for doing it themselves. 
Is that is that kind of what your experience is? There's a couple of things. Um, firstly, you ultimately were the product. Well, <laughs> when there was one, when there was a, in that situation where you had five teams, say, or six teams, mm-hmm. and you had multiple product owners mm-hmm. working with you. Yeah. Who was ultimately responsible for making decisions about the product? Ultimately, it was me. There we go. Yeah. So there was one product owner. Mm-hmm. Now, does that mean that you couldn't have and delegate and, and have proxies? And no reason why you can't do that. People right. you trust, hey, you're the expert in you know, this particular bizarre, arcane part of the product. And mm-hmm. I trust you on that. But ultimately, it's my head on the block. I'm responsible for that. You know, right. I, I think that... You're right. The responsible, sorry, accountable for that. The mm-hmm. responsibility for delivering it is is ultimately the nexus's responsibility. But the um, but yeah, I, I what we see over again, over and over again, is when organisations don't have that and they don't have you being the person responsible. I just use your example. Right. Right. It slows down decision making, and there's a lot of well, how can I describe it? democracy, politics, all that mm-hmm. kind of very inefficient. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't mind democracy. I think it's a fabulous way of running countries. I just know that if I want to deliver product fast and I want to get feedback and rapid learning, that sometimes it's better to make decisions. And and again, mm-hmm. this is also leveled at, at Scrum and Agile in general, and Scrum in particular, like, well, surely the team should make decisions. And that my experience is that you really need somebody driving that, but particularly at the start, but but actually throughout, as teams change, as a situation change, you need somebody that defines that sort of direction, that sets true north and gets everybody running towards. Right. It really does help. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe bureaucracy and all this one day will replace this, but at the moment, I have seen it thousands of times yeah, the, it just makes the most sense. So you do have one person. That, now, the teams, you asked another question, is do you have to be mature to do this? In my opinion, yes. It, I do not believe that you can scale agility yeah. with immature teams that are... Now, does, does that mean they can't work on this stuff? Does that mean they can't get mature together? Right. Of, of course they can. Right. You know, the... Uh, it's this sort of, will you ever be good enough to do it? And as you know, part of you goes, oh my God, there's so much more to learn. Mm-hmm. But start with one team, yeah. get good at it. You know, just at least get a few sprints under your belt. Then add another, get a few, maybe add two more. I get a few, you know, start, it's like freezing a pond. Start at the edges, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Don't try to freeze the whole thing in one go. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just incredibly difficult. And like climbing a mountain, all of those metaphors, you know. Something that was interesting is, and I didn't see it in there, usually there's a concept of first team. So if I'm a product owner on a team, uh, you know, that's my first team. Is the first team concept here the knit for the product owner? No, you know, that's another, we talked about it a lot. It, it is a common practice. It isn't, it isn't in the book because it wasn't universal. We actually don't even talk particularly about adoption, okay. really, okay. as you notice. Um, that was an, a couple of chapters that we debated putting in, mm-hmm. of which that would have been part of a, a pattern. Uh, mm-hmm. something that, so if you ever see myself or Kurt or Trish present, we always talk about it. It's not in the book. It is something that we but strongly believe in. Uh, we believe in that sort of like growing, uh, sort of whatever, like a virus or a, I don't know, like an, a, an amoeba or yeah, right. that sort of model. Um, um, uh, Jeff, Jeff Sutherland talks a lot about fractals and growing like that, you know, sort of like how ice grows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He talks a lot about that. So yeah, it is definitely a very consistent, best practice uh, and if we'd have added the um, introducing Nexus in a bit more detail and added a real you know we'd have adoption series of chapters we would have definitely added that yeah it looks like the stakeholders uh, you know managing stakeholders is, doesn't look like anything changes from that aspect it looks like you know same team involvement everything seems the same at scale you have to think about ultimately having such huge dependencies on individuals. So you really do have to make an effort for the teams to have more of a relationship with the customer, with the, you know, now making them necessarily have any strong relationship with stakeholders that are 
you know, the sort of like the police force, as it were, of right. an organization I wouldn't recommend. But you need that customer involvement. You need that design thinking. You need that empathy. That And it's, when you only have one team, sometimes you can survive with the product owner having that and being able to passionately describe things in, a, in an appropriate level so the team gets it. But my experience is the most successful teams are ones that have that relationship with customers and users and get an experience from that that point of view and the, and and that's another reason why we wanted to reduce that sort of if we could have had product owners in all the teams they suddenly become that choke point yeah. if you're not careful you know oh everything has to go through the product owner everything has to go you know and any external emails have to be val you know val yeah. validated by that's a disaster yeah. because it's good if the team send an email that's inappropriate, well, not inappropriate, inappropriate, you know, don't right. do not do me too kind of stuff. But if they send an email that says, oh, the system needs to do this, and the, and the stakeholder goes, are you smoking something? That's good. Yeah. Because then we know that, oh, there's a misunderstanding. You know, that yeah. those empathy maps are incredibly valuable as a technique, but also every time we do something, it's great. No, I agree. And there was lots of other little things I liked. And it wasn't in the framework part of the book, but it was in the, kind of the stories and the, and the examples and everything else. Um, I Well, actually, one of the things that was part of the framework is one product backlog. So you have, you have nine teams, you have one backlog. You don't have nine backlogs that you put together. You have one single backlog with everything in it, right? All work yep. is work. I love that part of it. You've got to have one of those things. And you go, well, but what happens if I'm just using a board? Well, dude, at scale, you can't. I mean, that is the reality. You love it or hate it, you're going to be using Jira or something else, yeah. probably Jira. Now, and then you say, oh, well, how do I manage? It's, you've got to have that transparency and yeah. you've got to manage it. And, you know, and, and the product owner is going to need help managing it because it's going to get complex. Mm -hmm. And the scrum masters are gonna, you know, or scrum master, the people that are you know, need to help him or her be, you know, and you're gonna be using tools on it. You're gonna be visualizing it. You're gonna be, you know, it, you've got to, but you've got to have one product backlog. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, you're gonna be in serious trouble, yeah. in my opinion. And and the best way to have one one consistent product backlog is to say no things so just get, get one backlog um i really like that part and also as you're going through the examples and some of the stories and again this wasn't part of the framework uh, but it seems like there's lots of embracing around uh, opportunity canvases and impact story maps a lot of tech practices that weren't in you know the original scrum guide you know xp isn't mentioned there um, you know, there's not any other technical practices, but here there's lots of discussion around single trunk uh, development type activities. Yeah. And, and so remember that Scrum is the minimum, not the maximum, the minimum that you can put in place right. to deliver. It's not a methodology, it's a framework. So right. it's a, literally you start with this very simple, very you know, very easy to understand, hopefully very hard to implement kind of model. And then you have to start layering practices. The first scrum book with Mike, Mike Beadle and Ken, the, 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 literally is XP and scrum, because that was what state of the art was back in those days. Mm -hmm. It was about, you know, TDD, not even BDD, TDD, it was like spikes, it was by, you know, good architectural practices. And um, very much Mike Beadle brought that and, and brought it in. And it was on top of scrum. And sometimes it was hard to differentiate one from the other. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody wants that methodology. Now, I don't know whether whichever practice, I don't know every practice that would be right for you. And every situation is slightly different. So what I, what, what I do know is that you need to start with this simple cadence, this planning cadence, this empiricism, this self-organization, and then you start layering practices on. Now, my experience, just just me, I find that things like continuous integration, continuous delivery, and trunk-based de development. I believe in TDD uh, or BDD, but you know that mm -hmm. kind of model of approach. I believe in you know gross refactoring. I believe in you know there's personally I love customer empathy map or customer journeys. Mm -hmm. You know those sort of things are awesome. I love personas. I love you know. But then suddenly you're layering all this stuff on top of Scrum as a mechanism. 
and that, and that will vary on your team's experience. You know, should I be doing TDD? Should I be doing BDD? Should I be doing, you know, no estimate? Should I be doing story points, T-shirt right. sizing? I don't know. Yeah. Depends on you. Right and remember, uh, and I have personal, very personal experience in this. I was the RUP product manager back in the day. Mm. So I worked with Dean and, and, mm -hmm. and the gang, Grady, Jim, Eva on RUP, Ration Unify process. Now, for the younger people listening, that was a process that was uh, when dinosaurs and mammoths still walked the earth, we we did build software mm -hmm. and we used something called the Ration Unify process. And, um, and I was the product manager and I had a really hard time saying no. And so everybody was like, I want to add mainframes. I want to add uh, real time. Mm -hmm. I want to add embedded, safety critical, mission critical, all this stuff. And we did. And then I had to build a process called the development case for allowing you to take that in your context. And now, of course, nobody could work out how to do that. So they all started with everything. Yeah. And so this sort of it was a it was a disaster because then guess what they said to me? Oh, I don't understand it. I need a plan to help me. I built a process about a process and I built a UML tool for delivering yeah. the process. The point is that this is the simplest as you possibly can and then you add things to it there is no silver bullet we're talking about complex problems right Corey? Yeah, i mean yeah. complex problems and they they aren't prescriptive we can't say this works every time you know what we can say is hey this you know framework is a great place to start then they'll start adding the things on top yeah. and uh, and nexus is just that by the way it's nothing more than that in the book we had to be a little bit more because otherwise we would find that um our case study would not have actually delivered. So yeah. we had to put some stuff on top. And hopefully they're the things that the people listening and the things that you are using every day yeah. because they're the things that we saw over and over again. Some of the other things I really like, there was lots of examples of boards and they were examples of more physical boards. And I really appreciate that. Again, we know we're going to use some tools at some point, but use tools that let you do boards that have you control them, not the, the tool control yeah. you, right? I really like that. Lots of reminders not to compare teams. Um, you know, <laughs> if you have nine teams, you know, don't don't say, well, these these two are good, this one sucks, and these three are you know struggling or something like that. Just treat them all the the same. You know, try to see where each one's struggling. Check with the integrations. Do all the same things you would normally do with with coaching and and delivery. Yeah. So the whole team things, um, uh, productivity measures, eh? Yes. The ability to compare teams. This team's velocity is higher than that team's. I don't care. So one thing that, you know, so I'm a Leicester City football fan, uh, the greatest football team in the world. Go! There you go. The Foxes. Sorry, just a little uh, shout out. Though we lost against Chelsea in the FA Cup, and I, even though we were the better side, we'll ignore that. So uh, we won the Premier League. We delivered our product and mm -hmm. delivered huge value mm -hmm. now if you individually look at any of the individuals on that team their scores would not have been great i, I think to some extent that's why americans don't like soccer because you can't do that you can't say oh my god my quarterback even though we were useless and lost all our games my quarterback's average was you know i don't mm. yeah so the the point is those individual productivity measures uh, are only ever useful for the team themselves so that they can learn into you know retrospect and and improve mm -hmm. you should never take those outside that context because it it changes the behavior of those teams and so you know i know that particularly i as a product manager or a product owner there's often a desire to sort of like have some sort of evidence that the team's delivering well the best evidence is product product yeah. can, you know being released that's integrated that's delivering value to customers if you can you can feel that you can touch that that's valuable concentrate on that and everything else is just noise that's that's a really great quote in the book and it's something that i've been i've been struggling with for about not struggling with but i've been trying to find a way to verbalize that and there was a in, in the book it says um there's a great quote that teams that earn trust by delivering value don't have to spend as much time assuring stakeholders that things are going well, that they are <laughs> transparent with the results and the results show steady progress. I love that. We have another expression in England, which is a proof of the pudding is in the eating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, bottom line is it's all about, it's, I don't care how 
effective you are at building puddings. And I don't care about how fabulous your kitchen maneuvers are. I want to get a great pudding that tastes nice. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that that's what you need to uh, concentrate on. And it's only when you start not delivering that does suddenly all, the, all those other things become important right actually they're not important right and uh delivery direct evidence is everything yeah. and uh, i encourage organizations to start capturing that direct evidence i agree that's 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 the big focus of what i try to do with with teams and the big focus of what i try to do you know with the podcast is is about delivery and we have to deliver value to our customers and that's what it's all about it's one thing about just sorry, you got me awfully no, excited go talking about delivering value. But so one thing about the Nexus uh, and, and, and what we found, okay. So we found we did talk to some organizations that weren't scaling Scrum effectively. I know, don't, don't tell anybody, but there are some. And what we found is that each individual team may have had a clear idea of their sprint mm -hmm. goal and even their focus but they didn't know why in the broader context. One of the most important roles of the product owner in a Nexus is to demonstrate, to clearly, to position that vision, that, 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 mm -hmm. that true north, that, that vision, that integrated value, and ultimately step away from worrying about the individual sprint goals of each team, you know, like in this particular team, we're doing this and in this and concentrate on that broad thing. It's like, it's like, so, so the mission of scrum.org is a simple one. It's to improve the profession of software delivery. And, you know, that's why Ken gets up every morning or that's why he makes me get up now and <laughs> phones me and, you know, and, and so whenever I, ever I do anything, anything, he always says, and now I'm wise to it, so I got smart, because initially I wasn't. He go, so Dave, how is that helping the profession of software delivery? Mm. And how are you measuring mm. its impact? I was like, bugger, that's completely caught me with trousers down. Back yes, to the vision oh, and goals, I was yeah. doing all this excellent stuff. I was going on about motion. I was mm -hmm. going on about, and he's like, that's really good. I, I'm glad you refined 40 you know, questions in PSM1. I'm glad you did all of those things. Mm -hmm. I trust that you're working very hard. What I don't necessarily trust is you're delivering the va most valuable things. So yeah. help me understand that. Yeah. And that was like one of these Jedi moments that you, you get from when you work with these really smart geezers and you're like, oh, damn. So what I would, one thing I would say over and over again to the product owner is don't assume that people know, particularly if you've got a hundred people working on an endeavor together, working, yeah. delivering a product together. Don't assume that. Yeah. Assume you need to tell them, tell them again, draw it on a board, maybe put some lights around it, tell yeah. them, tell them again. And every single Nexus Spring planning event or whatever you want to call it, um, every single Nexus daily scrum, Nexus sprint review, remind them, mm -hmm. hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is our mission. This is why we're trying to do this. Yep. This is what the focus of this two week, four week, three week, whatever it is, period of time, the sprint. Come on, guys, this is where we're trying to go. And that becomes a lot more important than all those PBIs you've taken into the sprint. And right. that's, I mean, that just may, means to an end, right? Yeah. yeah. Until they actually start A, repeating it back to you, and B, more importantly, processing it themselves and telling their own version of that same story, that means they get it, right? They understand it, not just you talking about it, but they've, they've understood it themselves and are able to kind of give it and say, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Exactly. Yeah. And it's so often that people aren't on the same page. Right. And I know we think, you know, things like uh, 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 customer journey maps or, you know, empathy mapping or those sort of things, uh, stories, all of these are techniques to try to get people on the page. But right. often we get so easily distracted by the detail of one product backlog item or one story or one defect or, you know, we forget that we have to sort of, hey, what are we trying to achieve? You know, that that goes back all the way to the things like the new new product game, which mm -hmm. is a fabulous HPR article that, that was written in the 80s that talk about what, how do these high performance teams deliver value? And they found universally that they had a very clear definition and understanding of the goal they were trying to achieve yeah. and how they did it. They were very creative. They tried all sorts of, it's like the Martian, isn't it? You know, there's mm -hmm. like the Giver, you know, the, mm -hmm. those sort of things. They do whatever they need to do to, to do it. Yeah. 
And there was a great um, uh, way, I think, to wrap up the book. Uh, in order to scale effectively, organizations need to deliberately and systematically grow strong and skilled scrum teams and detect and remove cross-team dependencies. So again, about coordination, about removing dependencies, um, really trying to get uh, teams talking to each other and working as a, a, a unit, albeit a larger unit in the case of a nexus. Exactly. I mean, ultimately, dependencies are bad. Yes. I mean, we know that, yes. right? You know, if you've ever done any uh, work on your house, you know that whenever you went and asked your prime contractor what's happening, he always, uh, and it was in my case, it's always been he's, but they they always say, oh, well, we're waiting on the plumber. Yeah. Or, or, and it's always a bloody plumber, actually, but that's another story. Uh, or maybe they say electrician. There's always some like comedy of ordering that, that they have to get in and it always puts everything back and it's always somebody else who's never there's fault. I mean, the the job of any good scrum, any good scrum of scrums, any good nexus is to remove as many dependencies so that the only dependencies that are really there are the real ones. And that we continuously try to manage a way, uh, manage them in. And, and the best way of doing that is continuous integration, yep. continuously trunk based development, continuously delivering it to make sure that everything works, that those dependencies are clear front and center and they, they don't get in the way. Very good. Okay. And we'll give some links. We'll, there'll be some links to the book and links to uh, other places, including some Scrum uh, case studies, uh, especially the FBI one, which I read and was very interesting, um, and some other things uh, around uh, the Nexus. So uh, lots of information for you if you want to look at uh, the Nexus for scaling. Now, Dave... One of the things I do on the show is whenever we have a guest, we ask them three questions. Okay. That sounds scary. Are you yeah. ready for your three questions? <laughs> okay. Yeah. What are the, yeah. Now uh, am I ready? I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, first question is name uh, three products or applications that you use in your personal life and tell me why you love them. I have a, uh, I have a Tesla. Ah. <laughs> And no wonder I, you're listening to the earnings call. <laughs> yeah, that's a part of it, really. And uh, much to my wife's annoyance, she's like, my God, that's a college fund. Anyway, but we'll like, ignore that for a second. The reason why I love it is because it's built around me mm. and everything's in the right place. Yeah. And and it's it's just the most natural product natural car and i've driven a lot of cars mm. including on the different side of the road yeah. and and i've, dri I've driven english cars <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry just, that just makes me cough a little and i and i you know and this is just a different experience mm. that user experience is just amazing um so that's one thing that i use mm -hmm. every day spotify i have to call them out because yes. they're us it not only is it awesome, you know, that I can find songs that uh, that remind me of my youth when I had hair, but mm -hmm. uh, I can share them with my wife and it's created a really nice social dynamic that I just, yeah, I just, um, I, yeah, it, it really has helped. I wouldn't say it's helped our marriage because that sounds like it needed help and it did. <laughs> it really didn't. Apart from the Tesla thing, it's been marvelous. Um, but it definitely has, <laughs> has made us as uh, good. And then the last thing is interesting because yesterday, so, okay, this is a little tip. So we, I, I was making, um, I was making uh, shepherd's pie uh, mm -hmm. for my family. And so they were quite, so I had to peel potatoes and mash potatoes. And so I, I, I'd recently broke both my masher and my, and my peeler and so i googled what the best mashers and peelers were my god the the engineer they've re-engineered them both oh, in yeah. the last, like t two years yeah. and literally i i would say that again it comes back to that sort of like ease of use mm -hmm. the, I, the masher has got circles rather than square and it's funny it just works mm -hmm. it cleans it sort of self cleans itself which is awesome yeah. and the peeler i didn't once slice any part of my anatomy with it it was just brilliant that's good and those two things and these were like eight dollars you yeah. know I, I i googled i looked you know read some interesting reviews surprising that some people do like hour-long reviews oh, of yeah. ashes probably people like us which is quite worrying <laughs> but the um and then i just you know 
I got onto Amazon and I bought them and they arrived two days later and I, I made a great shepherd's pie last night. I have to say, one of my least pain. So those are the three things that, uh, that, uh, that, that I use on a daily basis. And Very nice. Okay. Uh, question number two, uh, what's the second most amazing thing you've seen a product owner do? The second most amazing thing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess well, my first one would be a survive, which I think is a very, sure. <laughs> I think that's a, a key one. It's a good one. I think, I think, I think inspire. I've mm. had, uh, I've worked with some pretty inspirational geezers in my life. People mm -hmm. like Jacobson and, you know, Eric Gammer and people like these guys and the ability to come in and, and tell stories, mm. which in ultimately inspire. I think though, that's probably, you know, after surviving, I think that's probably the most, you know, amazing to be able to inspire. Okay. It's, uh, is a and tell and I think doing it through stories. I think yeah. stories are, are much. I I wish I was a better storyteller. Mm. I always want to be a better storyteller. I'd recommend, you know, if you can just tell a story that has a human being in it, it makes it so much more intimate for the people listening rather than oh factual blah blah blah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Uh, and the third question: uh, What product ideas are you most excited about for the future? I tell you what I'm not super excited about. Okay. If somebody says artificial intelligence to me one more time, yeah. I'm going to punch them. You know, everybody thinks that you can apply AI to every single thing and it and it's suddenly, oh, it's going to change the world. I don't think it I I yeah. So instead, I really if we're talking about product ownership and, mm -hmm. and ideas that can help product owners, I think that the integration of design thinking with delivery in a more holistic way. I really love the work of Jeff and Josh Lean UX. Yeah. I love what they've been doing. I love, you know, Jeff Patton and, and right. he always, you know, he raises the bar. But Jeff and Josh have been really and the ability to sort of make it more actionable, less about some guy in a beret and a turtleneck and more about you know, making it real to people that can deliver and making it less this sort of like magic that you do around design. And uh, I, I want it to be more accessible. I want to be able to instantly be able to comprehend my users using a combination of data, empathy, you know, um, stories and in a very concise and effective way. Uh, if I can do that, then um, I think that would be awesome. Very and cool. I'm really excited about the improvements I see around that. Very cool. All right. Three questions for Dave West. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, so for any feedback or any questions about product ownership, you can contact the show on Twitter at Delivercast or email us at Delivercast at gmail.com. If you do enjoy the show, please share it with a friend. Tell them why you love it. And while you're at it, you can leave us a rating and review. We have one question from a listener. Um, Kiona asks a question about product owners with a technical background. She says, I've been contacted a few times recently by recruiters for product owner roles, which I'm very interested in pursuing. But most of my experience is technical and in business data analysis roles where I worked with SQL and performed product support ownership tasks daily. The recruiters say my background seems great for a product owner. I worked with a product owner before, but she was on the business side. Thoughts on the role of a product owner for someone with a technical background I want to stay technical, she says. Uh, okay, so product owners being technical. I've worked with and, and continue to work with some product owners who are more technical than business. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're looking at a, if you're looking at a, a, a scale, <laughs> they, they like technology a little bit more than they do the business side, but they understand that the role of the product owner is what, when, not how. Um, so if you're, if you want to stay technical as a product owner and you want to tell people how to build something, then I would say that's wrong. Um, if you want to stay a product owner and be interested in new technologies and what technologies can do for you, I think that's, I'm interested in new technologies and what they can do with me, uh, for me, uh, for the teams and for the products that we're building. Um, so I think that's fine to have some technical background, some technical, technical interest 
It's just if you want to start coding and keep doing that, then I don't think the product owner role is the right one uh, for that type of uh, application. What do you think, Dave? So, no, I, I completely agree. I think, though, I mean, it obviously depends on the product. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're if you're a data, if, you, if the product's a database, yeah. uh, for instance, then yeah. probably Kona would perfect skills. It would be great. If the product is a financial services, uh, I don't know, annuity management tool, yeah, you might not, you know, that might not be right. I think the most important thing, single thing for any product owner is uh, your ability to empathize with customers and understand what value really mm -hmm. means. Okay. However, that, and it's a combination of customers plus business model, obviously. If you can do those two things, uh, I think that then go for it. I agree with your point that it's very easy to be a product owner and then suddenly be the technical geezer as well. That 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 separation of church and state is actually really important in, in terms of Scrum because otherwise you end up with oh the you know you're both doing the development caring about you. I like the fact you have that separation. It should be two separate people. So um, by all means, let's say technical. I, I, you know, I must. I always describe myself as a software engineer, even though I've been a product owner for the last, oh gosh, long, long time. Mm. It's embarrassing to say that. I even had to write a book with software engineering in it to avoid this sort of like feeling that I was inadequate. <laughs> but the, um, the so now I consider myself deeply technical and love technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but I care about how it's used and how society can take advantage of it for its own betterment. Yeah. And if that is your sort of mantra, then become a product owner. We'd love to have you in our community to making us better and keeping us honest. If, however, you care more about the product and less about its use, then I don't think it's necessarily the right role. Yeah. Very good. Hope that helps, Kiana. Um, and Dave West, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, Dave is at David J. West on Twitter and allthingsscrum.org. Uh, anything else you wanted to promote, Dave? No, no. I mean, just uh, be transparent. Talk to us. You, you know, Nexus is out there. Use it. Don't worry about if you're using other scaling frameworks. Just use the ideas. It doesn't matter. I'm not. It's not a religion. You won't get thrown out if you use a combination. <laughs> well, not in our gang, anyway. I, yeah. maybe others, I don't know. But ultimately, you know, li live and learn. Use it. Learn by doing. Uh, it's all about learning, isn't it? So uh, um, read the book, look at the white papers, and then if you've got any questions or comments, feel free to ping us up at scrum.org or tweet me or or any, you know, be, we're, we're not a million miles away, so feel free to reach out. Very good. All right. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and if you would like any one-on-one -on -one help with finding your product owner balance, uh, coaching or consulting, you can check out seekkaiju.com. All opinions expressed here are mine. You can find more of them. That is Corey Bryan on Twitter, and that is episode 67, Delivered, Go Out and Own Your Outcome. This show is part of the Agile Podcast Network. For more shows and information, visit agilepodcastnetwork.com.